to take your Bible, if you will, and look with me to the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews, and we're going to start a brand new series this morning that's going to carry us through that 13th chapter over the next few months. Now, I say over the next few months because uh, we're going to work slowly through this. I think it's necessary simply because of the magnitude of the message that is contained in this wonderful, wonderful book. You say, Mike, why in the world are you, um, why are you going through Hebrews? I, that's never been one of my devotional books. Uh, I find it to be uh, uh, really a struggle with the interpretation often, and it's a little wordy, and it's, it's got a lot of Old Testament uh, in it. And so why are you going through that? And, and why don't you preach more like you did last Sunday and those topics? And why don't you preach? You know, I found it. You know what I found out? You just can't please everybody. Now, I will tell you, there is a stirring in me, and I don't know where it's going to lead just yet, uh, but there is a stirring in me out of the book of Genesis um, to do something on broken relationships uh, that, that are found in that first book of the Bible. Well, you don't have to read very far until you come across them. So, you know, I'm going to be interrupting this study for quite a while, uh, so it'll take us a little longer than normal to get through this book uh, because of some of the interruptions along the way. Uh, but but here, here's my deal. I, I thought, um, why did he write this? What's the message behind it? And of course, there, there are probably three or four major themes that are in here. But I think the writer, you say, well, who's the writer? Well, all I know is it's a man. Uh, if it had been a woman, they would have called it Shebrews, but it, it, that's about all I know at this point. Um, I read something very interesting in, in the last few days, uh, uh, really an argument that it was uh, Luke who, who wrote this. I, I don't know. Most people think that Paul wrote it, uh, but there's all kinds of speculations as to who. But what really uh, cemented this direction for me is the last chapter and uh, 13, and I believe it's verse 29, don't hold me to that, but 22, I believe it's 22, verse 22. Paul, uh, now I have a habit of saying Paul. The writer says, um, I hope that you receive this word as a source of encouragement to you, an exhortation, a, a word of encouragement. And I thought, wow, you know, our churches today need encouraging. John Maxwell made this statement uh, years ago that people get so discouraged they could uh, sit on a curb and dangle their feet. I, do you ever get discouraged? Well, my prayer is that in these ongoing weeks that we have before us, that God's going to take his word and that he's going to use it as a great source of encouragement to you. Now, there, there are two or three good nuggets in here this morning that I believe with all of my heart that a lot of folks are going to need and receive and are going to be encouraged by them. So let's dig in now in this passage and beginning in verse number one. God who at sun, I love the way that he starts it out. God, that's a pretty good way to start out a letter, isn't it? God, he, he just presupposes that everybody is in agreement that God is God and that he's real. He, he, he doesn't set out on some kind of endeavor to convince people of the existence of God, he just nails it. God, who at sundry times, who different times and in different ways speak in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Let, let me just stop right there and talk to you a minute about the perfection of Christ. Not only is Christ perfect, uh, Flawless. He is complete. He's everything that you will ever need. God, who at different times and in different ways, what did he say? Spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Now, when you get to thinking about how that verse unfolds, what he's simply saying is that in that Old Testament, God divulged himself 
in bits and in pieces to the prophets of old. He didn't, he didn't lay out the whole package of who God was. He didn't reveal everything about God to one particular prophet. The fact of the matter is he couldn't do that. Not that he couldn't do it, but the prophets couldn't handle it. There would be no one man that could receive the full revelation of who God is. But in the Old Testament, he, he just did it a little bit here and a little bit there exposing God unto man himself. Many times and various ways that he, he didn't give the full revelation or disclosure of God, but just gave the prophets partial knowledge. Now, now many ways, he said, that's interesting. Don't you find that the Bible is such a colorful book? Uh, 40 authors over 1,500 years uh, putting it all uh, together there, uh, that, that he showed us uh, his concern. He showed us and revealed to himself. When we look at the book of Amos, uh, we notice in the book of Amos in that prophet that uh, God showed his concern for the poor. When you get to studying the prophet of Isaiah, you discover the holiness of God. When, when you look at Jeremiah, you look at God's compassion through the, uh, the, the weeping prophet that he is called. Oh, I, I love the book of Hosea, and I know that you do because it's in the book of Hosea that we discover that God is such a forgiving God. And then you get into the book of Ezekiel, the prophet, you discover the wrath of God and the judgment of God. So he revealed himself through the prophets in many different ways, but in no situation, in no circumstance, unto no person till Jesus shows up did God completely and fully reveal himself. Now notice verse two. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Now, notice the contrast between verse two and verse one. Verse one, I just reveal myself a little bit here and a little bit there, a, a bit here and a piece there. Oh, but when my son showed up, when Jesus came on the scene, you got a full picture of who that I really am. In these last days, God spoke through his son. And you get through the structure, if you will, of verse number two, that God is revealing to all of us and to all of mankind, all of humanity, that I want you to know that Jesus is my final offer unto man. Not gonna give you anything else. He's the fullest offer, the complete offer. But he's also my final offer in these last days. I've revealed myself. Now, understand something. He's all we need. We, we don't need anything else. So let, let me give you the second. It, it's the prosperity of Christ. Again, in verse two, if you'll notice in the middle of that, he said, to whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. Now, hear my heart a minute. Um, you you got to get hold of the fact that Jesus wasn't just born in a manger in Bethlehem. That, that was not where he just showed up and got his start. The Bible says that he was with God in the beginning. The Bible says that he was there even with God. If you read John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the word was God. So he, he was there in, cre he was participating, if you will, uh, in the creative acts of God. You understand Jesus is not some Johnny come lately that showed up by surprise in a manger in Bethlehem. The writer says that he was there at the creation. Now I love what he says here. Notice again in verse two, he hath appointed heir of all things. So all things belong to Jesus. They are his by right of creation. They are his by right of authority. Now, now you hear the Bible says in him uh, all the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God 
reside. That, that's a powerful statement. That's a powerful verse. But here's something that I, that I want to encourage you with. He says, he is appointed heir of all things. Well, get this. Everything that's coming to him is also coming to you. Why? Because we're heirs and joint heirs with Jesus as a believer. Every, everything that's coming to you. I've I, I played in a, in a one of these uh, benefit golf tournaments over at Piper Glen recently. Have y'all ever driven through Piper Glen and saw those houses that are over there? I, I look out in the yard and, and there, there are 30 year olds that live in there, 35 year olds in these multi-million dollar houses. They've got about four or five cars sitting in the driveway. Some of their teenagers are driving cars uh, that cost $150,000. I'm thinking, where in the world are you kids getting this money? Can I get a witness from anybody here? Most of them inherited it, I promise you that. But, but I look at that house and I look at that car, one of these days, that house is gonna look like a shack compared to what we're gonna inherit. That car that's sitting in the driveway is gonna look like a gremlin to us. I see that I'm not the only one that had one of them. Hey, I, I, I got you one up. I had one of those American Motors Pacers with the bub, big bubble thing on it. You had to roll down the window to open up the door from the outside. Oh, but one of these days, Amen. there's gay coming, ladies and gentlemen, when you're gonna get it all. You may, you may be as poor as Job's turkey right now, but one day, you're gonna have it all. Okay. Now, let me talk to you a minute about the preeminence of Christ. I, I want you to get this because uh, what the writer's doing here is making a big deal about the divinity of Jesus. Now, now, now watch this in verse three. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. Powerful word. The, 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 word the, the, the word there, brightness, is the word radiance of his Glory. Now you have to understand uh, that God is accommodating our finiteness with the language here because there's really no word in Greek that can describe what God is pouring into this man through the power of the Holy Spirit. So he's doing the best he can uh, to describe it with us. It's almost untranslatable to, to capture what the Holy Spirit is revealing. You, you understand what he's saying is that nobody can separate the brightness from its source. Y'all remember what the sun looked like, didn't you? I mean, it hadn't, it's been a while, but you do remember what the sun looks like. When, when the sun comes out, you can't separate the sun from the light and the warmth that it produces. They are inseparable. And, and so when you're talking about God here, you cannot separate his radiance from who he really is. They are intricately connected. And so you can't separate the Son of God from God. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus is not just a reflection of God. He is a whole lot more than that. He is the exact representation of God, the very stamp of God's nature. I love what J.B. Phillips said uh, about this. He translates it, the flawless expression of the nature of God. So, so, so he's, he's said, saying the same thing that Jesus said, when you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Uh, I have the, have the JWs come by every once in a while. Y'all have the JWs swing by your house? Had one come by, have, actually there was a couple of them came by on a Sunday afternoon. And uh, I'm wore out and I've been preaching and, and, and was ready to relax and my doorbell rang. And so they came on in and, 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 and I, I, don't, I said, come on in, let's, let's sit down. Let's, let, let's talk about Jesus for a few minutes. And they said, well, we're not here to talk about Jesus. I said, well, you're in my house and on my couch, so we're gonna talk about Jesus for a minute. Who is Jesus to you? And 
Well, he, you know, he's a created being like an, an angel. So I, I even took the word of God out and, and used their translation too, that world translation. And, and I pulled out John 1 and I showed them in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And they had a real problem with that. But I'm going to tell you where they have a real big problem. They don't know what to do with this passage. So hold your spot in Hebrews and go with me to Colossians a minute. I want to show you, I want to show you a passage. Colossians, uh, look at chapter uh, 1, chapter 1 of the book of Colossians. It's not, not too far back toward Matthew, okay? I, I want you to look with me, first of all, at uh, verse 15. Uh, who is the image? Talk about Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Then in verse 18, and he's the head of the body, the church, who's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the supremacy. But then take and go to chapter 2 and look at verse 9. They don't know what to do with this. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In Jesus dwells all of the fullness of God bodily. So you turn to the JW and you ask him, what, 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 do, you, what do you think about this verse? <clears throat> and it basically translates the same thing in their, in their Bible. <clears throat> well, I, <clears throat> we, we'll have to get back with you on that. I, I, we'll have to get back with you. And they got their satchels and they go out the door. We'll get, we, we'll get back with you. Well, that was in 1988. Anyway, <laughs> we, we talk about the preeminence of Christ. Now watch this as we get to the power of Christ. Watch verse 3. I'm back in Hebrews 1 now, verse 3. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. Wow. Now this kind of blows deism out the window. You say, well, now preacher, that's one of those theological terms that, you know, we, we really don't, what's deism? That, that's one of those things you get in seminary. What, what's deism? Deism holds the belief that, okay, we give you the fact that God exists. We give you that. And the deist will then say, all right, we give you the fact that, okay, God did create everything. But now here's where we separate. The deist will say, yes, there's God. Yes, God created everything. But after creation, he takes a step back, puts on automatic pilot, and just lets everything run its course. But God's word says he holds everything together by the word of his power. That, that just kind of shoots down the word, shoots down the deistic beliefs. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 17, the Bible says that in Christ. All things are held together. All things are glued together. That, that, that means that your life, everything in the universe is held together by the very one who created it to begin with. So I just say to you this morning that the one who created everything is still in control and he holds everything together. He doesn't wake up every morning and to check to make sure that the motors in our cars are going to run. He didn't wake up in the morning to make sure that your heart is still beating. He doesn't wake up in the morning to make sure the sun's going to come up and the rivers are still flowing. He's not in some kind of maintenance mode in his role up in heaven. No, 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 no. What the, what the real sentiment of this verse is is that God is holding everything together and he is bringing us toward an ultimate goal. That he's got it all right here and he's got a plan and that plan is taking us somewhere. He's got a goal for us. Now, I don't know about you, but it encourages me to know that I'm headed somewhere. I'm blessed by that. Now, a bunch of you came here today just like all the rest of us. We got issues in our life. 
Anybody in here that does not have an issue going on in their life, would you please hold your hand up? And if you raised your hand, I just want you to know you've got an issue. <laughs> to those of you that are going through a broken and a cracked marriage, God is in control and he's taking you somewhere. To, to those of you that are going through a health storm, you're headed somewhere. To those of you who have too much month at the end of the money, you're headed somewhere. To some of those that have lost their job, received a pink slip, you're headed somewhere. To those of you that are facing some major depressive things going on in your life and in your family, you're headed somewhere. So be encouraged. God's got it and you're going somewhere. I got behind a car some time ago that had a bumper sticker on it that said, don't follow me, I'm lost too. Well, well, I'd love to just buy me a bumper sticker and put it on the back of my car. Go ahead and follow me. I know where I'm going and I am headed someplace. I, I'm headed, my first stop on my journey is when the trumpet sounds and I am raptured up out of this old world. My second stop is gonna be in glory and it just gets better and better after that. I'm headed somewhere. Why? God is in control. He's taking us someplace. Now, let me, let, me, let me get on here now and just show you that it is by the word of God. He says, by the word of his power. You understand that it was the word of the Lord where demons had to kneel and where they just fell apart. It was at the word of God that deaf ears were opened and they were made to hear, that blind eyes were made to see, the lame were made to walk, the dead were raised to life. It was by the word of the power of Jesus when he stood at the tomb and he said, hey, Lazarus, your sisters say that you're dead. Hey, the mourners around here say that you're dead. Uh, the, the, the morticians say that you're dead. But I say that you're not dead, you have life. And so Lazarus, get up. And Lazarus walked out of that grave. How? At the power of the word of God. And may I say to you that the same Lord Jesus who stood there at the tomb of his friend Lazarus and brought life to death, can I just say to you, he's still in control, he hasn't changed, and he's in control of every situation that you're facing today. All right? Now watch this, it gets gooder, it gets gooder. Verse three, who by the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins. You understand something, listen to this. Jesus did something that the prophets couldn't do. He purged our sins. Jesus did something that the Aaronic priesthood could not do. They couldn't purge our sins, but Jesus did. Jesus did something that the law was incapable of doing. He purged our sins. Don't you miss the point of Jesus coming to this world. He didn't come down here, as I've told you numerous times, to make this world a better place. He did not come down here to eradicate prejudices, although that is an admirable thing that ought to be done. He did not come down here to set up a democratic government. He didn't come down here to save the whales or the spotted owls or the mussels over there in the streams. He came for one reason, and that was to purge us from the very thing that Satan had been holding over us in dominion and strongholds of the guilt and the shame of our sin that had separated us from God. Jesus came and put his foot on the neck of Satan and delivered us from the bondage of sin and shame. Even at his birth, it was declared that he will save his people from our sin. Long before he was ever the line of the tribe of Judah, he was the savior of our souls. Let me give you the last one. It's the position of Christ. I think you're gonna like this one. 
when he purged us our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. What did he sit down for? Tetelestai. It's finished. I took care of the sin problem. And so he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. In Hebrew history, the right hand was always a place of prominence. It was always a place of authority. By the way, you, you got to understand God is right-handed and those that really believe him are right-handed people too. If you're left-handed, you just left out, don't they? I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. He sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You understand Jesus lived and died to save us. He rose and he sat down to intercede for us. The Bible says he ever liveth to make intercession for us. What does that mean? It means he is in glory today at the right hand of his father securing our salvation. Now, I don't know about you, but when that reality hit my heart, it set me free to become who God wanted me to be and set me free from this work that I thought that I had to do to stay saved. My salvation is not dependent on the, whether the fact of my good outweighing my bad. I couldn't be lost if I wanted to. Why? Because I have a Savior in glory at the right hand of the throne of God that is securing my salvation until he receives me into glory. That's good preaching, Mike. I'm telling you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You understand, here's the, here's the real essence of, of the message. You could gather all of the kings, all of the princes, all of the queens, all of the potentates, all of the rulers that have ever existed, and you could melt them into one, and you could put them right here in this room, and Jesus would still be better. He would still be superior. He would still be greater. The Bible says that God has dealt with man in numerous fashions, in times past, but in these last days, and I think what he's saying is right now, we, by the way, <laughs> this has nothing to do with the message, but I do believe that we're living in the last of the last days. In these last days, God has made a complete and a final offer unto us, and it's his son, Jesus I was in an Uber in New York City this week um, and my driver was from China, had been in, in, in the States for about 10 years and um, he, he, he came to the United States, couldn't speak a word of English and barely could get out a few things now, barely understand a few things now. He, he spoke Mandarin. But, but he said, you know, when I got here, um, I, I was reminded of being in my homeland that I couldn't go to church anywhere. There were no churches for me to go to. And, and when I got here, I saw all of these churches, all of these churches. And, and so I asked somebody on the street one day, can I go in there? And they said, of course, it's a public place. You can go in there anytime. He said, so every Sunday for the last 10 years, I've been going to this church. Now it happened to be a Catholic church. And so I, I began to gently deal with him. And I showed him John 14. I said, Young, Jesus said in the 14th chapter of John, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And no one comes to the Father but by me. His face lit up. He reached over into the console and he pulled out a little business card and on the back of the business card, somebody had written, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the... He said, you mean this? I said, yeah, Young, that's exactly what I mean. I said, Young, God's dealing with you. And we talked about Jesus for the next 10 to 15 minutes on our trip. God's final offer. 
He is the only way. He is the only truth. He is the only life. He's God's final offer to mankind. And if you ever expect to get into heaven, you have to come by Jesus. Now, how many of you at some point in your life realized that you were a sinner in need of a savior? And you ask God to forgive you of your sin and you ask him to come into your heart and your life. And you ask him to save your soul. And, and really, you've had a life change since then. And you know now that if you were to die, you'd go to heaven because you have received God's final offer. Would you hold your hand up good and high for me for just a minute? Pastor, I know that if I were to die, I'd go to heaven because Jesus lives his life in me. I'm on my way to heaven right now because I have been saved. Jesus is God's final offer into my life. Thank you. Hands are down. Now, if you couldn't raise your hand, and there were many who couldn't, don't you want to get out from under the bondage of sin? Don't you want to be free of the shame and the guilt? Don't you want to have the assurance that when you die, you're going to go to heaven? You say, Pastor, I think everybody, including me, wants that. If that's your desire and you really, really are ready to turn away from sin and you're willing to embrace God's final offer and you want your sins to be forgiven and you want to have the assurance that when you die, you're going to go to heaven. I want you to pray something. You don't even have to close your eyes, but I want you to pray something like this with me, will you? Pray something like this. Heavenly Father, I do believe that Jesus died on a cross for my sin. Just pray it right where you're sitting. I believe that he rose from the dead on that third day. And God, my sin has separated me from you. Would you please forgive me of all my sin? Would you come into my heart today? Would you save my soul? With your help, Father, I'll live for you the rest of my life. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.